trade unions. Well, I think everybody trying to unite uh, one way or the other, getting some something organized one way or the other. Trade union strikes, usually. Trade unions troubles. Get different pay and go on strike and all that lot. Well, they look after you, look after your job. Just a load of rubbish. Unnecessary evil. I'd never think about them. Trade unions? Power. What makes you say that? That's what they are, powerful. And that's how they come across in everything they do. They just wield power. Our research department have chosen out of the comprehensive list submitted by the TUC, uh, those unions that are not affiliated to the TUC but have applied for registration. Now we know in a number of cases there are objections. I brought the list in and in my report you can give consideration to it. Anything else on page eight? Uh, page nine. I've got out a separate report regarding the Birmingham property issue, uh -huh. uh, and I'll let you have the facts uh, by next Tuesday. Well, in time for uh, to discuss it next Tuesday. I've asked the question down in Oxford to Hughie Scanlon, and so I've uh, I don't know whether you can regard that as having met Hughie Scanlon. Uh, have you got but anywhere? Pardon? Have you got anywhere with him? Well, 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 I asked get, the question get, and he answered it. Yeah, he answered it very much to my satisfaction. For speaking to him, like, you know, Pardon? it's the same with boy, isn't it? Well, everybody can't. Uh, can't. No, we know everybody can't, but we're saying we have a procedure how we can get to a senior and we have a procedure how we can get to a district official. But once you go above a district official, Jesus Christ, you could meet God quicker. <laughs> No matter what state you're in, Christ still loves you. And this morning our message is that whatever the state of your life, Christ is standing with his outstretched hand, willing to catch you, willing to straighten out your life, willing to give you a confidence again, a direction that can only come to those who trust him. And so this morning, if you are unhappy, if you feel you've lost your way in life, why not put your hand out, grasp the outstretched hand of Christ? I can assure you, it's a step you will never regret. As a youth, I adopted as my life's motto the words of Charles Kingsley, I must headlong into seas of toil, leap far from self, and spend my soul on others. And I don't want to be sanctimonious or super-duper religious when I say that by offering my services as a full-time official in my union, I felt I was taking the opportunity of giving a practical demonstration of that dedication. So to me, it's not a job. A, it's a vacation, it's a calling. Well, these are the whips, and this is almost the exact spot where in September 1932 I began my engineering apprenticeship. We were paid during that period the handsome sum of anything from 10 shillings to about 18 shillings after your fifth year. Well, it wasn't very much money to, to live on, and gradually it dawned on us that, well, we'd need to do something about it. And so, first myself, then the others, joined the union. We elected leaders, and of course I was elected the sort of unofficial uh, shop steward of the apprentices, and I became a very important leader. But of course nobody paid any attention to me, nor my organization, until eventually we took the bit between our teeth and, well, the inevitable happened. We decided to withdraw our labor. What a revolution. The revolution was just round the corner. And very soon, we were the talk of the country. The strike spread throughout the whole of the Clyde side, and within a week or two, there were about 30,000 apprentices all out on strike.
that famous 1937 apprentices strike was my first big incident. The union, for the first time in its history, got the negotiating rights to represent apprentices. We got substantial increases in wages. And the sad thing about it is that by the time the strike was settled, my apprenticeship terminated and I never got a penny of it. Because the day we started after the strike, I was a journeyman. I first became a full-time trade union official when I was elected to become the first Clydeside assistant divisional organiser our union ever had. And in 1953, after a terrific struggle, as the executive councilman for the whole of Scotland. And there I have remained until May of this year. The enclosed correspondence is self-explanatory. You'll note the dissatisfaction expressed. The general secretary of the union is the chief administrator of the union. He is in complete charge of the 650 employees. He is the editor of the journal, which is a very strong opinion former within the union. He is also responsible for making sure the money is collected correctly, properly audited and spent wisely. Now, those three things are quite a task in themselves. Uh, no, I, I really am very busy. Could you ring back again? Thank you. Thank you. Hey, well, the, the research department has prepared a synopsis uh, and they've extracted the real juicy parts yes. where there's quite blatant interference by the press in our elections. Now, the question I was going to ask you, Huey, one thing that a leader of workers must always understand is that they should not so concentrate on business efficiency that the instrument they're privileged to lead should turn itself into an administrative machine in which decisions are taken on the basis of a business acumen because in the last analysis it exists to serve people to satisfy their longings and so therefore uh, uh, at the at the price of, of, of perhaps uh, not concentrating on administrative and business efficiency in the way that I would like to, but uh, in a way I hope I don't neglect, I have always got to keep close touch with the rank and file members. As long as you keep your feet on the ground, as long as you keep in direct communication with your membership, then there's very little excuse for you wandering off into pathways that are not symptomatic of their thinking. Oh, yes, oh, yes. Uh, you have the angle put on the backs and all that. I see. How long have you been a shop steward? Here. No official in my union has had more elections than I have, having been the youngest ever to be elected in the history of the union. By that measuring rod, it would appear that the rank and file, who are the only people who can vote, seem to think that I am in touch with them when they vote me in so regularly. Well, thanks okay. for all your services to the union. Thank you very much. Too much. Right, right. There's a lot said of bad relationships in British industry, but quite honestly, when we go to look at other countries' factories, we don't find them working any no. better than we are. I often say that uh, I fail to recognise the Britain I live in with the Britain that's described both at home and abroad. Yeah. And I think that's yeah. true. Yeah. Of course, goodness is never news. No. If anybody gets drunk and goes down Wolverhampton High Street and, and breaks Burton's plate glass window, it'd be hauled before the magistrates and it would be in the local paper. But if the same man got captured by a Salvation Army captain and dragged to the Citadel and got wonderfully converted, it wouldn't be news, it wouldn't be in the local paper. It would be in the war cry, of course, but it wouldn't be in the, <laughs> in the local paper. Goodness is never news. That's yeah. the point I'm making. Yeah. I have enough experience to know that the union is not my union. It's not yours either. None of us were here at the beginning of it, and I doubt whether the youngest of us will be here if ever the utopia comes when the working class don't require a trade union. But rather is the union something of which we are but stewards for the 10, 20, 30, 40 or 50 years that we may be activists within it. And so because it doesn't belong to us and we are but stewards of it, then it falls very heavily on the shoulders of all of us that we must do what we can to keep it a bright, 
sharp, intelligently militant instrument defending and advancing the interests of our members, no matter where they work. Now, the third point... That the hard slogging of visiting workshops, visiting branch meetings, visiting meetings of shop stewards, visiting meetings of local officials, that's the only sure way you can keep in touch. Going round today at the Apprentices School, I, just for the sake of saying something that seemed to me reasonably intelligent, I said, so that's a one to two mic you're reading. He says, no, sir, it's a 25 to 50 mic. <laughs> <laughs> so I shut up all the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> Shall I speak now? Well, now, having been introduced as a trade union official, let me say this, that good and important Though membership of a trade union is, it can never replace the importance and the dignity of being a good workman. And it must never be used as a defense for sloppy or inefficient workmanship. My worst memory was in 1926, as a very young schoolboy, uh, lining up every day at the local miners' soup kitchens behind the miners' rows, where in the, in the container or the boiler, which used, was used for washing clothes, miners' wives would be making soup, and you queued up there for your jug of soup every day. And then, early mornings, at the same period, uh, when you thought the police were not as active as they otherwise might be, going to the local coal pit and stealing coal. Stealing's the wrong word to use, I think, but taking coal anyway from the coal pit. And we called them bings in Scotland. Now, these were bad old days. No pleasant memories, because you were very often hungry. Houses were, homes were very often cold. Everything that could be pawned had been pawned to buy what clothes you, you, they could buy and so on. So the good old days are not so good as far as I'm concerned. Mr. Lane, you've yeah. been writing to me. That's right, yes. Yeah. Ah. Yes, we've got Mr. Preston coming along in shortly, yes. the personnel ah. director. Industrial democracy is something that quite a number of people have been advocating for decades in Britain. There should be room for a worker in industry or in an office to have a say in the policy of the firm, what they're producing, how they're producing it, and so on, and participating in real decision-making.
that our present government is already sold on the idea that workers, by some method, must sit on boards of directors. I think we have good reason to believe that a Labour government will pay more attention to what the TUC thinks than it may pay attention to what other folk think. And so you can therefore see how important it is that TUC thinking is symptomatic of your thinking. Because you are part of the ten and a half million workers who form the hundred and forty odd trade unions that are in membership of the TUC. What we've got to do is to look at the TUC's thinking. And if indeed arising from our discussion this morning, we reach the conclusion, either as groups or as individuals, that what the TUC is advocating is not what you want, then all of us have a responsibility through our own individual unions and through our own local branches to convey to our union executive what precisely we think. I was the original uh, advocate of the worker director scheme in the British iron and steel industry, whereby workers, not trade union officials, but workers who must work at the plant, the bench, the melting shop, drive the crane, sweep the floor, take their place in the normal day-to-day, week-by-week boardroom discussions, expressing a worker's viewpoint and all the host of things that arise, many hundreds of pounds and many, many hours and days and weeks were spent eh, on and by these worker directors in order to help them understand the balance sheet, order to understand some eh, management techniques, marketing problems, production problems, so that they had as good an understanding of that particular industry, as did the existing directors. Now, I've done a considerable study on that steel industry, and to my, my opinion, and to many others' opinion, the sympathy of every trade unionist went to those men who unfortunately took the position of directors in the steel industry. Because if ever any man got a blinking hard return, it was those men. It was the worst thing that was ever invented by man or beast. It takes both sides to participate, and I think this is what is not happening. But what do you mean by participation? The participation we've got in British Leyland is, is certainly well, it's not it's in his early days, isn't it? Oh, oh, it's early early days. Days. How can we've a man, how can Dougie, for example, go to a meeting where the manager or the director has got three, four or five experts behind him? Who has Dougie got behind him? Well, there? OK, not okay there's soul. a lesson there. There's right. a lesson but there. But how did the unions build up their influence well, anyway? Stage by stage, they it built up. You make a little bit of progress and you build on it. Yeah, but all right. So, so, so if Dougie goes and takes a decision, what's unpalatable to Cowley Assembly Plan? What does all the blokes on the shop floor say? They've got ah, to be educated. Dougie, Dougie was a nice bloke when he was a steward and senior steward, but now he's joined that lot up there. He's, he's getting out. all the background. Yeah, he's getting this, he's getting that. And he's selling us down the river. Now, and you left wow, his say you're the progressive ones, honestly. You and I see industrial democracy uh, as something which is a step forward into again enriching and uh, making life more full and satisfying to the worker to help them understand that they're part of industry and this is part of them and they have a say in it after all two-thirds of their life is spent in it I've always believed that before wealth can be shared, it has to be created. We may look in the past and examine all the crass vulgarity of unbridled capitalism, which caused many hardships to many people. But what people don't seem to understand is this. It doesn't matter what system of society we have in this country. The only thing that workers can be sure of in life is that they'll always need to work. And we will only enjoy increased wealth to the extent that we create it. So whilst profits, because of the distant past, is a dirty word in the minds of the mass of trade unionists, it's what that money is put to that matters.
I don't separate society into that which is capitalist and that which is just communist, the employer and the employee. After all, if a working man saves his money and he puts it either into the bank or into an insurance, that money is circulated. It is used to buy machinery, to create other wealth-producing instruments, and thus to get a return on their capital. And so who are the capitalists? Who are the socialists? The system we live in today, you've got to agree with what he says. If you don't create wealth, you can't get anything out of it. If we were in a free bargaining position and British Lena made about £400,000 profit, you could get a bigger slice of the cake yourself near there, not making any profit at all. He says we'll get a bigger slice of the cake, Cliff. Well, you're in a better bargaining position near there, mate. You're going off to side. You're going on, Cliff. You're going on. Where are we talking about the wealth? 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 That's what you got out of the apple when you were getting the welfare up there. Wealth for whom? Wealth for the man on the shop floor? Wealth for the unemployed? Wealth for the people who are actually doing the work? Or wealth to be taken away and squandered in some other part of the world? Yeah, because you get the wealth. Look, let's be honest. We had uh, British Ireland had a place in Spain. They had a place in Italy. They had a place in, in Australia. And every yeah. single one of them had gone down the drain. Is that our fault? Is that the fault yeah. of the men, the workers? There's yeah. something in the region of uh, uh, 11, 15,000 million pounds invested aboard. Yeah, does, does, that something bring in does that bring in returns? Why yeah, but it, I don't understand yeah, what it is. does. Right. It brings in returns Invisible. for a minority. It doesn't, bring in, it doesn't bring in the returns for the majority yeah. of the people that originally created the yeah. wealth. Yeah. That yeah. is the difference. But let's get back to basics. basics, ba yeah. basics is this. As long as we're generating um, a, a production uh, and we're getting something off the assembly lines what we can sell what in turn gets money back into the country so it keeps us employed yeah, keeps the state from paying unemployment pay that's all we want if we can keep that circle going who's worried about bloody profit <laughs> Scottish one. Yes, yes. Is it 25 years ago, John, since we went looking for that holiday home? And I brought. Yes, and we missed the last bus. We missed the last bus. Yeah, the last train. And we got a hitchhike. A hitchhike between Glasgow and Motherwell. Yes, by a drunk man. Aye. A, a master builder he was. Do you remember? And he, was, he was drunk. <laughs> Absolutely, he was going. That's true. And he picked us up at Mount Vernon. And, and he was taking the full breadth of the road. Remember that story too? Remember you said to him, he, he said he was a master builder, and you said, oh, I'm on the other side of the dike from you then. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a, <laughs> I'm a trade union official, do you remember? <laughs> Good morning, friends. It's our pleasure to hold an open-air meeting in your street this morning. These are the words of our first song. I joined the Salvation Army because I was attracted to the boys' band. Uh, they told me quite clearly I couldn't join the boys' band until I came to the Sunday school. So I went to the Sunday school, and after a three months probation period, they gave me an instrument. And I played an E-flat bass until I was 16, when I was then transferred to what we call in the Salvation Army the senior band. And because I was a much bigger boy by then, they gave me a bigger bass and they gave me the double B bombardment. Easy to play, but awful heavy to carry. The Salvation Army don't indoctrinate you. It was a slow, voluntary process. One can't attend Bible classes without beginning to understand what religion is all about and that uh, there is a power beyond that of our own 
And so I gradually unfolded in my mind the belief in a God, a God that was a personal God, a God that through prayer and uh, reading of his word could guide one in one's life. And thus began a Christian experience which I've held tenaciously on to right down throughout the years. I have found that the more you uh, live near Christ and seek his guidance in your life, then as the months and years roll on, the more confident you become and the less effect has any worldly experience on you. I, I don't think I could ever have been a trade union official, particularly in my union, as long as I have been without that deep faith and base in my life. I think that life and politics and industry and trade unions is all about power. I think we've got to live with this situation and not bemoan the fact that yesterday's feeble instruments are today's powerful ones. For example, trade unions. That political parties, yesterday's powerful instruments, now more democratized and forced to listen to what the people have to say. I think we've got to live with that. And the challenge to me and the challenge to all of us is not to complain about the new power instruments, but to seek to direct that power and telescope that power into fruitful, enabling, enriching channels, and to use that power wisely. We should go around with a collection then. Yeah. you and this morning our message is that whatever the state of your life Christ is standing with his outstretched hand willing to catch you willing to straighten out your life willing to give you a confidence again a direction that can only come to those who trust him and so this morning if you are unhappy if you feel you've lost your way in life why not put your hand out, grasp the outstretched hand of Christ? I can assure you, it's a step you will never regret. As a youth, I adopted as my life's motto, Trade unions. Well, 
I think everybody trying to unite uh, one way or the other, getting some something organised one way or the other. Trade union strikes, usually. Trade unions troubles. Get different pay and go on strike and all that luck. Well, they look after you, look after your job. Just a load of rubbish. Unnecessary evil. I'd never think about them. Trade unions? Power. What makes you say that? That's what they are, powerful. And that's how they come across in everything they do. They just wield power. Our research department have chosen out of the comprehensive list submitted by the TUC, the words of Charles Kingsley, I must headlong into seas of toil, leap far from self and spend my soul on others. And I don't want to be sanctimonious or super duper religious when I say that by offering my services as a full-time official in my union, I felt I was taking the opportunity of giving a practical demonstration of that dedication. So to me, it's not a job. Uh, it's a vacation, it's a calling. Well, these are the whips, and this is almost the exact spot where in September 1932, I began my engineering apprenticeship. We were paid during that period the handsome sum of anything from 10 shillings to about 18 shillings after your fifth year. Well, it wasn't very much money to, to live on, and gradually it dawned on us that, well, we'd need to do something about it. And so, first myself, then the others, joined the union. We elected leaders, and of course I was elected the sort of unofficial uh, shop steward of the apprentices, and I became a very important leader, but of course nobody paid any attention to me, nor my organisation. Until eventually we took the bit between our teeth, and well, the inevitable happened. We decided to withdraw our labour. What a revolution! The revolution was just round the corner. And very soon we were the talk of the country. The strike spread throughout the whole of the Clyde side, and within a week or two, there were about 30,000 apprentices all out on strike. That famous 1937 apprentices strike was my first big incident. The union, for the first time in its history, got the negotiating rights to represent apprentices. We got substantial increases in wages. And the sad thing about it is that by the time the strike was settled, my apprenticeship terminated and I never got a penny of it because the day we started after the strike, I was a journeyman. I first became a full-time trade union official. Those unions that are not affiliated to the TUC but have applied for registration. Now, we know in a number of cases there are objections. I brought the list in, and in my report, you can give consideration to it. Anything else on page 8? Uh, page 9? I've got out a separate report regarding the Birmingham property issue. Uh -huh. uh, and I'll let you have the facts uh, by next Tuesday. Well, in time for, uh, to discuss it next Tuesday. I've asked the question down in Oxford to Huey Scanlon. And so I've, uh, I don't know whether you can regard that as that? having met Huey Scanlon. Uh, have you got but anywhere there? Pardon? Have you got anywhere with him? Well, 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 I asked the question and he answered it. He answered it very much the speaking to him, like, you know, Pardon? it's the same with Boyd, isn't it? Well, everybody can't. Uh, well, we know everybody can't, but we're saying we have a procedure how we can get to a senior and we have a procedure how we can get to a district official. But once you go above a district official, Jesus Christ, you could meet God quicker. <laughs>